Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to the second day of 33rd Annual Scientific Session 2021 of the Physiological Society of Sri Lanka. A kind reminder to the audience, as we are going to start the session shortly, please be kind enough to mute yourself to keep silent mode and turn off the video. Now, I cordially invite Professor Niranga Devanarayana, President, Physiological Society of Sri Lanka, to give the introduction of the orator. Good morning. Welcome to the annual Professor Valentine Basnaika Memorial Oration 2021. Professor Basnaika was born on 1st of October 1925 and had a distinguished academic career at uh, St. Joseph's College, Colombo Medical School, and at the University of Oxford. When the second medical school was established in Peradini in 1962, he was one of the pioneer academics who joined this faculty and subsequently became the professor of physiology. Professor Basnayaka was the third Sri Lankan professor of physiology. He loved, his love for physiology culminated with the formulation of the Physiological Society of Sri Lanka in 1987 as his brainchild. He was not only a gifted teacher, but also a born scientist. He encouraged his students to use simple and practical approach to look at scientific phenomena. He is adored and idealized by several generations of medical students who had the privilege of studying under him. This year, the Valentine Basnaika Memorial Oration is delivered by a distinguished researcher in pediatric gastroenterology, Professor Nikhil Tapa. Professor Nikhil Tapa is the Professor of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Queensland, and the Director of the Gastroenterology and Hepatology and Liver Transplant Services at Queensland's Children's Hospital, Brisbane, Australia, where he leads a specialist statewide multidisciplinary clinical service for children with gastrointestinal mortality and functional disorders. Previously, he was the academic lead for pediatric gastroenterology and head of the neurogastroenterology and motility service at the Great Ormond Street Hospital, University, of Col University College of London, UK. He's a very good trainer, and I, I had the privilege of training under him at the neurogastroenterology and motility unit as a Commonwealth Fellow in 2017. His research has focused on pathogenesis and treatment of gut motility disorders, including the potential for regenerative medicine as a novel therapy for most severe gastrointestinal neuromuscular disorders. Professor Tapa has published more than 150 original articles in these fields in highly reputed journals. Professor Tapa is a co-editor of the textbook of pediatric neurogastroenterology and associate editor of the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. He sits on the wrong five committee of for functional gastrointestinal disorders, as well as gastroenterology committee of the Asian Pan Pacific Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, chairing its neurogastroenterology and mortality working group. He was, a, he was previously the chair of the gastroenterology committee of the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. He was a lead organizer of the first World Congress on Pediatric Neurogastroenterology and Mortality held in Adelaide, Australia in April 2021. It is a great pleasure to invite Professor Nikhil Tapa to deliver the Valentine Basnaika Memorial Oration for the year 2021. Here's to you, Professor Tapa. Thank you, uh, Professor Devan Arayana. I hope uh, everyone can hear me. I am just I'm going to try and get my presentation up. Um, Professor Devan Arayana, thank you for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. And uh, Professor Devan Arayana and esteemed colleagues, friends, and guests of the Physiological Society of, uh, of Sri Lanka, um, it is such an immense pleasure to be able to, uh, or to be asked to actually give this year's uh, Valentine Basnayake um, oration um, to this uh, wonderful audience. Um, it is not only a pleasure, but it's actually a real privilege and honor to be able to do so. I guess my only uh, regret is that I cannot be there in person uh, with you in beautiful Sri Lanka, 
to be able to share this uh, scientific uh, congress. I'm really grateful for the kind invitation. Now, Professor Devanarayana, you talked a little bit about um, Professor Valentin Basnayake and, and what he achieved. What struck me when I was looking through the biography of uh, Professor Basanayake was not only the fact that he was a, a physiologist um, and a scientist, but in fact, he was a teacher and an educator. And what I do know is that all of us in whatever we have achieved have really only achieved this because of the people along the way that have taught us, that have mentored us, that have supervised us, and ultimately that have inspired us to do what we have done. And I guess Professor Bastayake's legacy, if I should say, is not only in the fact that he helped found uh, your very learned uh, society, but in fact, over the 30 odd years that this society has been running, you have continued to nurture and foster up and coming physiologists, academics, clinicians. And these people are not only well known in, in Sri Lanka and contribute to physiology, but are known throughout the Asia Pacific region and also contributed significantly on the global stage. Now, I guess the next step is really to say that if I'm talking to such a learned audience, then clearly the thing which really must stand out is that you have very well-developed brains. I don't know whether you actually are the top 5% of brains in Sri Lanka. So what I was saying is that, of course, the brain is a, it's a remarkable organ. And if you were to believe uh, Sandeep Maheshwari, um, you have also learned the ability to unlock the full potential of your brain because you are, of course, all successful uh, people. So if you were to ask me that if I was to put up the center of the universe, what organ would I choose to sit at the center of the universe? And of course, I would say the gastrointestinal tract. Now, to some of you, it may surprise you that I'm saying that. But of course, many of you would say, of course, that's not a surprise. He said that he's a gastroenterologist. Of course, he's going to be biased um, and he has to justify his existence. So, of course, he's chosen the gastrointestinal tract as the body's most wonderful and beautiful organ. Of course, foremost, I'm a scientist. So therefore, I need to justify why I have put a picture of this organ at the center of the universe. But of course, you know that more than 140 years ago, Charles Darwin uh, proposed the theory of evolution, where he suggested that man evolved over hundreds of millions of years from more simple vertebrate creatures. And hence, at the bottom of the cartoon, this reference that man is but a worm. And in fact, this is the oldest known vertebrate, so Pikeia gracilans. So these were fossils which were discovered in the uh, Yoho National Park in Canada. Um, the fossils date back about 505 million years. And in fact, this is the earliest known vertebrate that we have been able to discover. So in many um, respects, this is the original uh, vertebrate from which we are all descended from. And perhaps um, we can see a little bit of a family resemblance. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, is whether or not you believe in the theory of evolution, what we do see within these, these primitive organisms and even the organisms, so many of the organisms that we are able to study today, is that they don't have a well-developed central nervous system. But in fact, in these most primitive organisms and the organisms that we see today as well, the best developed nervous system that they actually had was the nervous system that ran along the length of the gut tube. And this nervous system or enteric nervous system has been so well developed that it is really the nervous system that really dictates many of the functions of that body. And in fact, it seems that the central nervous system really evolved as we developed limbs, as we started um, to uh, walk around, 
as we developed our senses, as we um, were able to actually use coordination with our limbs. And in fact, if we actually look at mammalian uh, systems, it is really not very different because along the entire length of the gastrointestinal tract, we have one of the largest nervous systems in the human body, the enteric nervous system. And this is a vast and complex nerve network that runs all the way from the esophagus right down to the anus. It contains as many neurons as the spinal cord, and it actually has a neuronal diversity similar to that of the central nervous system. So almost every neurotransmitter that you can imagine also exists within the enteric nervous system. And in fact, in mammalian species such as humans, the enteric nervous system is the brains behind the gastrointestinal tract. And we know that the gastrointestinal tract has a whole range of functions. And these functions are not only digestion, absorption, and excretion, but of course, the gut is involved in homeostasis. It houses one of the largest immune organs in the body. It is the largest endocrine organ. It is tasked with growth. It allows us to adapt to the environment. It's increasingly associated with psychology, happy gut, happy mind, and also well-being. And of course, one of the important developments over the last two decades has really been the discovery and study that within the gastrointestinal tract is this enormous population of microorganisms, of bacteria, of fungi, of viruses, of protists that really don't exist within the gastrointestinal tract, but actually contribute to health and well being within the body. And for example, when we look at the enteric nervous system, we know that this microbiome is able to effectively control the development of the enteric nervous system. And as the enteric nervous system develops, it continually controls the activity. This is a bi-directional crosstalk between the bugs within the gut and the enteric nervous system. And although I've compared and contrasted the brain a little bit, in truth, the brain and the gut are totally hardwired together, largely through the sympathetic, uh, through the autonomic nervous system. And this relationship and crosstalk between the microbiota, the gut and the brain underpins one of the most important relationships that we are able to describe today that is really central to health and well-being and also disease development. And that is the microbiota gut brain axis. And really, as we have learned about this axis, we know so much about this constant crosstalk that occurs between the microbiota in the lumen, between the gut, its immune system, its enteric nervous system, all the way up to the brain and back down again. And what we've learned is that as children go through development, especially in the early vulnerable years of development, that this microbiota gut brain axis is very vulnerable to damage. And this can be damaged through even psychosocial events. They could be damaged through medical events and factors such as infections and even the use of, of antibiotics. And eventually we are now learning that as you disrupt this microbiota gut brain axis, you may actually develop disease. And in fact, the best studied diseases that evolve from disturbance of the microbiota gut brain axis are so-called functional gastrointestinal disorders. And we know of many such disorders. In fact, these disorders are often the commonest disorders that we will have to deal with as pediatricians and gastroenterologists. And in fact, perhaps I don't need to talk so much to you about functional gastrointestinal disorders, because of course, in the room there, you have at least two of the world leading scientists within the field of functional gastrointestinal disorders. So of course, Professor Deva Narayana and Professor Shaman Rajindrajit, I've really been eminent in this field and really allowing us to understand so much more about these very common gastrointestinal disorders. And in fact, I was trying to pick some of the publications that they have contributed in the worldwide um, and I could not fit everything, not even one slide, two slides, three slides. So I have actually just put a small proportion uh, 
of really what they have been fundamental in contributing in. Now, it's not only these common diseases, but it's even the more severe gastrointestinal diseases. So some of the most severe are so-called enteric neuropathies, where there is damage to the structure and or function of the enteric nervous system. And these tend to be rarer disorders, but many are very devastating. And what I wanted to do over this oration is really try and show you the kinds of things that we are doing within the gastrointestinal tract that we have really heavily allowed in understanding normal physiology, in understanding how that physiology helps us understand diseases better, um, how we use physiology to try and diagnose these conditions, and ultimately to try and improve the treatments that are available. Now, to try and illustrate this, I want to start with something that is hopefully really close to everybody's heart. And I know that in Sri Lanka, that you have some of the best food in the entire world. So I wanted to start off with a simple process of feeding. So we know that there are many biological processes that occur during feeding. And this isn't only processes that occur at the time we feed, but in fact, these processes start before we feed and they continue after we have completed the meal. So for example, if you think before a meal, the very sight, um, the smell, the expectation of receiving food actually evokes a whole host of biological responses. So you increase salivation, um, you, the stomach begins to uh, relax to uh, allow you to accommodate the meal. You have an increase in gastric secretions. You have an increase in small intestinal secretions as well. And in fact, here in Brisbane, there is now research looking at small prem premature babies that are tube fed to see whether you can actually improve the tolerance of their feeds by exposing them to things that they don't normally get exposed to, such as the smell of the milk, such as the taste of the milk in the mouth, to see whether this can actually improve the tolerance of feeds. And then of course, is the actual act of feeding itself. And there are various complex processes that occur, uh, occur along the length of the gastrointestinal tract, right down from the mouth, right down to the end of the large bowel. And these aren't only processes that are involved in breaking down and digesting and absorbing nutrients, but very importantly, are about moving them along in a very carefully ordered function. So for example, if you take a meal, you will move it into the stomach. You then need to store it within the stomach. You then need to break down the food and in a very coordinated fashion, move it towards the small intestine. And there you will have mixing and propulsion to ensure the optimal digestion and absorption before you move it down to the large bowel to eventually get expelled. Now, this is a video of a mouse gut, which has been dissected out and placed in a dish. And what it shows you is, is a number of key things. Firstly, that the gastrointestinal tract is able to function in terms of motility autonomously. What we're actually seeing here is very precise functioning of the gastrointestinal tract. So in the small intestine, we can see what is very clear segmentation uh, contractions, and these are contractions which allow us to optimally mix digestive juices and the food we've ingested. And then, of course, we can also see that there's propulsion in the more distal bowel. And when we look at the large intestine, we see the very different type of motility, because now we're starting to see the mass movements, which are gradually moving this pellet down towards the anal open. Now, we can use this understanding of physiology within the clinic as well. And how do we study, study a small intestinal activity within the clinic? Well, we can place a catheter. So we can place a very specialized catheter, such as an antrodiodenal manometry catheter. It has special sensors along its length. In this case, one of my patients has had this catheter placed into the small intestine, and the child is now sitting there watching her favorite television program, and we can actually look at the contractility of the small intestine. And we get a reading such as this. So this is a, a low resolution tracing of uh, gastrointestinal activity. At the top, 
of the image, we can see these large spikes of gastric activity, very precisely occurring at three cycles uh, per minute, very strong contractions. And then lower in the small intestine, these are extended um, in a very nicely coordinated contraction known as a migrating multi-complex. And these contractions are again occurring very precisely at between nine and 12 cycles per minute. And in fact, now with improvements in technology, we can actually have high resolution images, which not only show the contractions, but also tell us a little a bit about the anatomy and the structure of the gastrointestinal tract and where these precise motility events are occurring. We can also do the same in the large intestine. So for example, this is a catheter placed in the colon. This is a ultra high resolution uh, catheter. And here we can see that we can now look at high amplitude propagating contractions in the colon, moving from the top of the colon down towards the anus. And again, we can convert these to color plots. And now we can start to actually also, like we did in the small intestine, understand a little bit about the anatomy of the large intestine. So in fact, we are now able to study any part of the gastrointestinal tract pretty much. And the contractions that occur in each part are quite different. In the esophagus, it's probably the well best defined. We had the best technology to study it. And not only can we see the precise contractions that occur during a swallow, um, with a swallow being initiated, peristalsis down the esophagus and relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter to allow food to move into the stomach. But we actually get a very good definition again of anatomy. But of course, what I'm not saying is that these individual parts of the gut work in isolation. Because of course, there is a constant communication occurring along the length of the gastrointestinal tract. So for example, the presence of food into the stomach and the proximal small intestine sends a message to the large intestine to induce mass movements. It stimulates the defecation reflex. And also there's a feedback. So for example, if you cannot clear the colon in children with constipation, they also then feed back from the colon to inhibit the function of the stomach. And often these children will lose their appetite and they will have very poor gastric motility while the colon is loaded. Now we can actually look at that in terms of the studies that I've just described to you. So for example, in small bowel manometry, so this is a tracing from a, a, a normal child who is having a, a small intestinal study. We can see that during the fasting study, there is this migrating motor complex. We can see quite random, largely infrequent activity. But within minutes, literally within minutes of starting to ingest a meal, we see that there is an abrupt change in small intestinal motility. There is a much more frequent contractions they're much uh, greater amplitude. And you can now imagine that the gut is starting to prepare itself for the arrival of the food so it can digest and absorb it. And this is so quick that we're still trying to understand what are the mechanisms that allow this signaling to occur. Well, clearly taste may be very important. So for example, in this instance, we actually see again, a child that is, uh, this is an adult uh, study of an adult taking a meal. And what we're now seeing is that again, this is a tracing of colonic motor activity. We can see that during the day, there's a lot of colonic activity. During the night, the colonic activity largely ceases. Upon waking, we see an increase of activity. But once we eat a meal, again, within minutes, that we start to see these colonic contractions which will eventually lead to defecation. Now, in an adult with slow transit constipation, where there is a disorder of the colon, we can see that this physiological reflex is actually lost. Now, we don't know what triggers this. We think that it could be partly due to these G-protein coupled receptors of taste within the mouth that may send some signaling. But in fact, one of the developments is really starting to understand that in fact, you have similar if I call them taste receptors or G-protein coupled receptors along the entire length of the gastrointestinal tract. So therefore, even the arrival within minutes of food within the stomach 
can actually start to uh, initiate a response within uh, enteroendocrine cells. They are able to release a whole host of neurons which can control hunger, which control the release of, of enzymes, which actually control motility of the entire gastrointestinal tract. But it's, it's far more complicated than that. So this is a very simple application onto the tip of the villus of uh, high uh, potassium and or serotonin of 5-HT. And the reading now is actually looking at the responses within deep within the muscle layer, within the myenteric plexus, the deep plexus of the enteric nervous system. And you can see here, there is an instantaneous depolarization of these cells of the myenteric plexus instantaneously. Now, of course, the use of, of high concentrations of potassium and serotonin is, we know that in physiology, but what about metabolites of nutrients? So in a very similar study, propionate is now applied to the tip of the villus. And what we can actually see in a very similar sense is activation again, which is very widespread and deep that is occurring within the gastrointestinal tract. So these physiological studies have really started to allow us to take them from studies of normality to start to explore how these may also help us in dealing with severe diseases. So I showed you this slide earlier on where I talked about enteric neuropathy. So a number of conditions where you either get a loss of the enteric nervous system, either from birth or a, uh, an acquired loss, or at the other end of the spectrum, where the enteric nervous system seems to be there, but is clearly disordered. And one of the most severe disorders that we will actually come across in, in gastroenterology is intestinal pseudoobstruction. Now, this is a disorder which can occur at any age. So it can occur in children right through to adults. There is a failure of motility activity of the small intestine and can extend the entire length of the gastrointestinal tract. And here we can see gut that is very distended. It's full of fluid, which the body cannot clear. Now in pediatrics, especially, this is very rapidly progressive. Almost all of these children will be unable to feed normally. They will require artificial nutrition. And in fact, because it's so different from adults, we recently changed the name of this condition to actually call it pediatric intestinal pseudoobstruction. Now, despite having considerable clinical expertise, there is so much morbidity we see within these children. I've talked about the fact that they need artificial nutrition. They spend the majority of their lives going in and out of hospital. And still in 2021, between 25 and 30% of these children will not survive, they will die. So we clearly need to do something. So how can we use things like physiology and our understanding of physiology to try and improve our understanding of disease, the diagnosis, and ultimately the treatment. Well, to do that, I want to start off by actually going to a, a really interesting study done by Professor Vesalis Pacnes based in the Crick Institute in the United Kingdom. Now, we talked about Professor Basnayaki as a, a mentor and an educator, and for me, Professor Vesalis Pacnes. So I did a PhD with him and he taught me what I know about the enteric nervous system and my work in regenerative medicine. So he posed a very simple question, and that's to say that we know the enteric nervous system has very precise activity, but if you look at it, it's actually not a very attractive nervous system. It looks very haphazard. It doesn't look like there's any organization or structure, not like the brain where we see very precise pathways. So how does something that looks so haphazard carry out function that is so very precise. Now, one group of genes in the body that controls precision of how we get ordered and organized structure within the body are the genes that are concerned with planar cell polarity. So for example, these genes will control what direction the hairs on a drosophila wing point in. And if you mutate these genes, for example, we can see that now the hairs are completely going in all different directions and are disordered. 
And we can see the same in the fur on the back of the paw of this animal. Again, a disruption of the genes causing a distortion of organization. So Professor Patnis found that, in fact, these genes are, 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 are uh, expressed within the gastrointestinal tract, very close to the expression of the enteric nervous system. So he then explored to say, well, if we mutate these genes, what effect would it have on the gut of these animals? And it had a dramatic effect. So when you mutated the genes, the animals were able to feed very poorly. They were very small. If you actually looked at the gastrointestinal tract, um, it looked like an animal with pseudo-obstruction. It was full of contents. It was dilated. And none of these contents were cleared. And eventually, these mice actually died. And when he looked at the motility, what he actually saw that compared to the control mouse, where the pellet that was introduced into the bowel was able to propagate very nicely in the mutant mice where this uh, mutation had occurred, the pellet really went nowhere. There was very disordered motility, which is what we in fact see within patients within intestinal pseudobstruction. So no matter how long I leave the video, the pellet really never moves to the bottom of the gut. But what was really interesting is that if you've distorted this, the enteric nervous system, should you see something? And they were surprised because when they looked at the enteric nervous system, it looked completely normal. There was no change in the appearance. There was no change in the number of neurons. There was no change in the neuronal subtypes that they could see. So this looks like, to all intents and purposes, as a normal enteric nervous system. So they studied the circuits a little bit closer. So what they did in the next experiments is that they actually started looking at individual neurons along the length of the enteric nervous system. And they looked at what direction they were sending their processes with the assumption that there must be some organization that allows this nervous system to speak to its, uh, each other and allow things to move in an ordered fashion. And what they found is that in the control uh, gut, all of the processes, or virtually all of them, pointed down towards the anus of the gut, so down the longitudinal axis of the gut. But in the mutants, there was much greater distortion of the processes and the direction that they pointed, and that probably underlay the, the fact that the circuits were now disrupted and we were not getting proper motility and the pellet could not be pushed along. And in fact, this whole situation is very similar to what we see in pseudobstruction. So in pseudo-obstruction, in children we know have very severe motility of the bowel. We can very easily nowadays get tissue. We use minimally invasive keyhole techniques to actually get good amounts of tissue. Um, we can then study the tissue using international guidelines. So we have coordination across centers. And still in the patients that we treat in about 40 to 50% of cases, we will find no defect of nerves within the gut. Although when we actually do a motility study, I remind you of a normal reading of this nice coordinated propagation. This is a child with pseudo obstruction, where now you're starting to see little bits of contraction, but in fact, one contraction is overlapping with another. When we introduce a meal, there is no postprandial response. There's no change in activity. This is complete failure of the nervous system. And yet in this child, when we look with histopathology, we can see no changes. So now we are concentrating our efforts to start to look to see how assessing the contractility of the gut helps us understand disease. And we very recently published this paper where we literally, I have a very hardworking PhD, who literally sat and looked at every single contraction over a 24 hour period to try and see whether we can actually improve our understanding of what is actually going on. And we've also done this in other conditions like slow transit constipation. In a way, this is like a pseudo obstruction of the colon. There's a lot of evidence now that this is likely to be a neuropathy, a defect of the enteric nervous system, although there is no agreement of what the defect is. So many studies say that if you study patients, both children and adults, the nervous system looks normal. Some of them report a reduction in neurons. Some of them report a reduction in a particular class of neurons but others don't find anything. So a similar sort of problem. 
So we, again, we went back and used uh, technology. We used high resolution colonic manometry and we studied children with slow transit constipation. And what we found on the left is a normal child. So we can see this beautiful high amplitude contraction moving down the colon. And because it's an intact nervous system, while this contraction is going down, it suppresses any activity of the rest of the colon in between the contractions. So you're shifting things down, you're completely quiet, and then you bring all the muscle together to move the stool down the large intestine. But when we looked with high resolution manometry and slow transit constipation, we saw that there was a failure to suppress this quiescence occurring between the contractions within the colon. So really what happened is that you started to push the stool down, but in fact, you then had a contraction occurring in an incoordinated fashion, which disrupted it. We then compared to this to histopathology and indeed showed that there was a very clear correlation between the lack of quiescence and some sort of disturbance of the nervous system of the bowel. And now we have really continued studies to try and apply these technologies across a whole host of diseases to try and understand whether we can better diagnose and characterize these conditions. And why do we need to do that? Because like I said to you, across all of these conditions, we have completely failed to provide appropriate treatment for the children that suffer these disorders. So what can we do? And what can we, in fact, use physiology to try and change the outcome in these children? Well, of course, we may be able to use electrical stimulation. So I've shown you that in slow transit constipation, there appears to be a disorder, a disruption of the nerve circuits within the bowel. So people such as Bridget Southwell, who works in the University of, uh, of Melbourne, um, basically then thought, well, similar to the heart, when you get disordered uh, neural conduction and, and disorder of heart function, that perhaps we can pace bake the gut to improve its function. So they carried out a number of studies using transinferential electrical stimulation, so the application of electrodes across uh, the, abdo the abdomen and the back, across the, um, the gastrointestinal tract. And they looked at groups of children with slow transit constipation. And what they found is that indeed, in these very small studies, that they could improve the defecation, the frequency of defecation in these children, they were having less in the way of accidents. They then studied the motility of the bowel, and it suggested that actually the use of this sort of pacemaking in a way appeared to improve the transit um, through the bowel, and this appeared to have an effect on contraction. Now, unfortunately, very small studies have been done, and these haven't been replicated across other centers, but it's beginning to start to get the field, to start to think about how we might assess children and which children might actually appropriately respond to these sorts of conditions. And in fact, we've achieved much more success in gastric pacing. So in the stomach, there are a number of disorders where we have very poor emptying of the stomach. We refer to these as gastroparesis. These children often can't feed. They often feel very full. They may have nausea. They may have very significant vomiting, which really impacts on the quality of life. And there's been now a number of studies that inserting a pacemaker into the stomach. Now remember, the stomach has a pacemaker system of its own. I showed you the three cycles per minute um, pacing of the stomach. So people have found that if you can invert, you can insert a pacemaker. Now these early studies, and I'm showing you results from one of the earlier study, the results were really intriguing because it took children with obvious uh, problems with gastric emptying, they had severe nausea, they had severe vomiting. They actually then paced these children both temporarily and permanently, and they showed a remarkable improvement in their vomiting and nausea. But the interesting thing was, it had no effect on actual emptying or motility of the stomach itself. So the effect wasn't occurring on the actual motility of function, but it seemed to be actually interfering with nerve networks taking sensation up to the brain. So it actually started to deal with the sensory effects of nausea and vomiting. And in fact, there have now been larger studies which have really confirmed that, that these are really good treatments 
for dealing with symptoms, but not necessarily with the motility function. And in fact, um, more recently, there's been wonderful work which has come out from the United uh, States uh, by researchers with Katya Kovacic, who have looked at, at auricular stimulation, likely of the, of the vagal nerve, to try and deal with children who get um, recurrent abdominal pain, so irritable bowel uh, syndrome. And they've actually shown that in those that have impaired vagal efficiency, that they appear to best respond to these neurostimulation treatments. And this is really exciting because in fact, drug treatments have failed within this group. And now we are actually sitting really at the start of therapies that much, might be much more effective. Unfortunately, there are some conditions where even neurostimulation is not really going to be sufficient. So for example, um, if we look at Hirschsprung's disease. So Hirschsprung's disease is a, is a birth disorder where the nerves fail to develop at the end, especially of the, of the large bowel. So in fact, the end of the colon has no nerves at all. The, the muscle remains contracted. It obstructs the flow of stool. And these children present with the intestinal obstruction. And we can see that the bowel above it is very dilated. Now, I did a, a background in regenerative medicine. And as part of that learning, we were actually looking at the development of the enteric nervous system. And we know that during formation of the neural tube, so what will become the spinal cord, there is a population of cells which become highly migratory. They migrate into the developing gastrointestinal tract. And as the video uh, here shows, they will um, migrate extensively down the entire length from the esophagus down to the anus and they will form this complex enteric nervous system. Now, what we know is that even after it's formed, it still has the capacity to repair itself. So we then looked at the possibility that if you had Hirschsprung's disease, that was there a possibility that we may be able to find stem cells that could still migrate and form an enteric nervous system within the guts um, of children, especially with those with diseases, especially from the part of the bowel that appears to be normal. Could we grow these in culture? They should be able to give rise to all of the nerves that we need. And then could we implant them back into the gut and actually cause, um, result in a cure for these very devastating conditions? Now, of course, this is complex and I'm going to present about 20 years of research in about two minutes you have to identify a source of these stem cells. You need to grow it. You need to get them to behave appropriately. And then you need to inject them back. You need them to survive within the gut. And then you need them to actually be functional. So many years ago, I set about in my PhD to actually find these cells within the gut because no one at that moment in time had actually even showed that you could get stem cells for nerves within gut after birth. And indeed, I was able to show in, uh, in a mouse species that you could actually find stem cells within the gut. You could grow these in culture and you could transplant them back into the gut itself. But the problem was we could show that all the nerves were there, but what we couldn't show is how they actually functioned. And of course, we were then able to use the physiological studies such as electrical stimulation, um, to actually look to see whether these stem cells that were transplanted were now able to integrate within the enteric nervous system. And people have actually used very clever systems, which you can use uh, in experimental work to actually use even light stimulation. So in this work from Melbourne of Heather Young and, and Lincoln Stamp, they actually um, uh, injected light sensitive uh, cells, these integrated within the enteric nervous system they could then expose them to light and stimulate these cells and they could evoke um, um, contractions and responses within the muscle. So in the future, maybe we will have children with severe disorders that we just have to shine a light onto the gut that we can actually stimulate the more normal contractions. Now, we went on to actually test the hypothesis. So could we actually rescue severe disease? Now, of course, we had to work initially with a model so this was a model of severe slow transit constipation in a mouse that lacks nitric oxide synthase. So nitric oxide synthase, so nitric oxide is an inhibitory 
neuron present within the gastrointestinal tract and is lost or disrupted within many motility disorders. So in fact, when you look at the gut of these mice, we can see that if we try and look for nitric oxide, not surprisingly, within the mice that have this mutated, they have no expression of nitric oxide synthase and they have slow transit constipation. So what we did is that we um, harvested uh, gut and in this case, we used fluorescent uh, enteric nervous system cells. So we, we basically broke down a, uh, a gut um, a donor gut, we could then sort out the fluorescent uh, enteric nervous system stem cells. We could then transplant some of these cells into the gut of a diseased animal to see what the effects were. And what we actually found is that within a couple of weeks of transplantation within the gut, it was able to colonize the entire length of the gastrointestinal tract. So here you can actually see the presence of nerve cells and processes throughout the entire length of the colon. We next wanted to see, well, can it change the function? So we actually looked at tissue physiology. So we know that in a nitric oxide knockout, we're going to use, we're going to lose inhibition. So we can actually see in a control animal that there is part of the graph here that is falls below the threshold. And what we actually found in the nitric oxide knockout is that you lose that response uh, within the tissue. And once we transplanted it, we were able to show using tissue physiology that we could restore that response um, that is present through the presence of nitric oxide synthase. But more importantly, when we actually looked at motility of the entire gut, so these uh, mice, had slow transit. So in fact, in the blue is a control animal. In, in, in the red is an animal that has a deficiency of nitric oxide synthase. And we look at transit, we see it's much longer than what we would expect to see in a control animal. We did a sham transplant. So we didn't actually transplant uh, stem cells. There was no change. But once we actually restored the nitric oxide, we saw that these mice actually restored their motility back to normal. So we actually took them from having slow transit constipation to actually having normal transit and no constipation at all. And of course, we were proud because this was the first time that it had ever been shown that you could use stem cells to actually recover in vivo the uh, a disease of the enteric nervous system. Now, of course, there's now lots of work in the stem cell field. So for example, we have collaborations looking at um, induced pluripotent stem cells, so they can be harvested from anyone, from any adult. You can harvest these cells. You can reprogram them to become enteric nervous cells. You can then inject them into the gut. And in fact, in Hirschsprung's disease, um, the group of Faranak uh, Fatahi is now based in San Francisco. They showed that these cells could colonize the missing uh, neurons within the enteric nervous system and actually rescue these mice from sure death. And we've now been able to actually think much bigger. So very recently with work with Paolo Di Coppi in London, we actually not only have taken all of our stem cell work, but also our understanding of physiology and connectivity to actually start to construct a whole segments of gut. So for example, we constructed an entire esophagus where we were able to get the epithelium, the muscle layers, and also start to get the nerve networks back into this. And this is really the direction that this field is going to go. So ladies and gentlemen, I've talked to you about various aspects of this gastrointestinal tract. And I hope I've convinced you that actually the gastrointestinal tract is an amazing organ and that we are starting to make steps. And this question of, is it the gastrointestinal tract that is more important? Is it the brain that is more important? In truth, I've just shown you that they are essentially hardwired together. And there's really very little difference because they are both phenomenal brains. But of course, as the famous expression goes that um, all organs are equal, but some organs are actually more equal than others, I will still finish by saying to you that, ladies and gentlemen, that the gastrointestinal tract is really a beautiful, phenomenal organ. 
we know actually very little about it. I've shown you how we have used gut physiology development to try and understand how we may better define diseases. We understand what is going on. What might we be used to diagnose them better? What might we use to treat them better? But what I wanted to do is to really finish off from where I started, and that is with uh, Professor Bas Nayaki. Because in fact, this is a paper that he published in 2004, um, where he, he actually calls this essay he writes, 50% terrific and 50% non-existent. And this was really around the dilemmas of medicine, the dilemmas that we face, that we're very good at doing things, but in fact, we're, we're very bad at, at, at doing things as well. So we're very good at, for example, at using antibiotics to clear infections, but we're very bad at trying to uh, prevent unnecessary use and increasing resistance. But in the same way, when we talk about gastrointestinal physiology and gastrointestinal disease, we know so much more about these diseases, but in fact, 50% of it, we still know absolutely nothing at all. And I hope I can plea to this very learned audience to go into the field of gastrointestinal physiology, to start to work with Shaman and, and Naranga to try and understand this organ better so we can really change the outcome of children that suffer from these horrendous diseases. Now, of course, I've talked a lot. Um, and none of this is really possible without collaboration. Um, and I really wanted to finish off by acknowledging all of the really tens of brilliant collaborators that are really responsible for so much of the work uh, that I've, I've shown um, and with that, I would again like to thank you for this, this wonderful opportunity to deliver the 2021 uh, Valentine Basnayake uh, oration to the Physiological Society of Sri Lanka. And I would really like to thank you all for your very kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nikhil Tapa, for your wonderful lecture on GI physiology, get into the guts of, the beauty, beauty, of a beautiful organ. Thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and delivering this uh, Valentine Basnaga Memorial Oration. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Devin Arayan. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So we have come to the end of the, this session on uh, Valentine Basnaga Memorial Oration. Thank you very much for your participation and please join the rest of the scientific program using the link provided uh, for the uh, registered participants. Thank you again. <laughs>